We are here for, in Bologna for celebrating the 30th years of uh, Truth and Objectivity, which was published uh, by Harvard University Press and written by Crispin exactly 30 years ago. And so we, we take the opportunity to ask to Crispin some questions on uh, his philosophical development, his views, and the basic ideas of truth and objectivity. And so, I mean, to start with, I'd like to ask you a, bi a biographical question. So how did you start uh, uh, in being interested in philosophy? Why did you choose to, to work as a philosopher? I got a scholarship to Cambridge um, from school, Birkenhead School in Cheshire, to read classics, to, to read Latin and Greek, uh, of which I was quite good. I uh, had a certain facility for that. Um, but when I got to Cambridge, um, the syllabus consisted of nothing but translation and language. You know, reading Greek texts, translating them into English, reading love poetry by John Donne and translating into Greek hexameters. You know. And I couldn't stand it. You know, within six weeks, I thought, I, I, I can't pursue this degree. I'll, I'm going to fail. I have no interest in this. Um, so I went to see my tutor, who was Dr. Casimir Louis. Um, and I said, what do I do? I'm, I'm a fish out of water here. I'm in the wrong subject. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, well, we may not let you change, one. But two, if you do, you'll have to change to a non-school subject. Okay. So that is um, psychology, or perhaps theology, <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps economics. So I thought economics, that might be interesting. And then I looked a bit at the, at the program, the syllabus, and there was too much mathematics in. I felt I had you know, too much tooling up to do to get into that. Uh, but he said the other thing is to do moral sciences, uh, so-called, that's to say philosophy, as it was then called in Cambridge. And it so happened I was on a, you know, colleges have these staircases with six offices, you know, and little flats where you stay. And four of the guys on my staircase were single-sex college. There were no women. Four of the guys there were doing moral sciences already. Mm -hmm. And they were talking this stuff day and night, you know, um, coffee, 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 drinks, you know, mm -hmm. talking more philosophy. And I got kind of sucked in. Um, I thought it was interesting. So I went to Louis and said, uh, I'd like to have a go at moral sciences. And he said, very well, we could maybe sanction that. But understand the following. If you do moral sciences, and you do it well, you'll be unfit for anything else. Okay. <laughs> and he was right. Um, anyway, one thing led to another. I did do moral sciences, and then I started on a PhD. Um, was told by Timothy Smiley that I should pack it in because I was getting nowhere. So rather than getting nowhere, I went to Oxford. And then everything followed from that. Yeah, and Oxford at the time was really... I mean, Oxford was extraordinary special. at that time. They had Michael Dummett, um, who was my main advisor there, but also P.F. Strawson, who was kind of the Olympian philosopher, you know, mm -hmm. the grand perspective mm -hmm. on all philosophical issues. And what did, uh, very impressive man. Um, Elizabeth Anscombe was there too then. Um, very intense classes and lectures. <laughs> we have to think what is correct to think. That's what he did. <laughs> Well, that was quite an experience. And H.P. Grice was then developing his ideas on conversation. Mm -hmm. Conversation of picture was very stimulating. So it was a fantastic environment to work in. And it made philosophy for a time easy. Because if you went and paid attention to these people, sort of thought about their lectures and read the stuff they recommended, the ideas would come. Okay. That's how I got into it. And before, uh, before moving to analytic philosophy, if I recollect correctly, so you started uh, thinking about Eggers and... Not quite in that order. Not quite in no, that order. No, I finished my PhD, which is on philosophy of mathematics, okay. which was, as it were, my first love. Um, and then I, I felt that I should broaden out. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to get a, an examination fellowship at All Souls. So I had lots of time. I suddenly had seven years funding, no commitments. So I thought, well, the way to broaden out is to get into continental philosophy and think about these issues from quite a different perspective. Um, and the way to get into continental philosophy is to start with Hegel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I thought, I'll do a defil on Hegel, and then I'll, then I'll be properly rounded as a philosopher. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Hegel simply defeated me. <laughs> <laughs> I could right. make nothing of it. Yeah. So I never finished that defil. That's, right. That's why you keep a picture of 
material yes. in your office. Yes, I have a picture of a real philosopher. <laughs> 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 Okay, speaking of philosophy, I mean, maybe we move to, to the year, maybe just before the publication of uh, Truth and Objectivity. So what, what were the motivations that brought you to, to, to think about this project and eventually to publish the book and the aims? So, um, yeah, how did that happen? I, I, I mentioned that I was primarily interested in philosophy of maths, and my, my first articles and attempts at writing were on Wittgenstein on mathematics. Um, and then on Frege, and I published a book um, in 1980, early 1980s, on Frege's conception of number, that is logicism. And then again, a lot of accidents involved. Um, I had a year visiting Princeton, uh, and they said you must give a seminar when you're here. So I thought, what can I do uh, in this hostile environment? How, what can I possibly bring uh, that might be of interest? And now, here's a technical point. Um, the key thought in Frege's philosophy of maths is a deflated notion of reference to objects. Okay, so the numbers aren't out there, and then we have to explain how earth we get in touch with them and know about them. No, in some sense, they're a projection of the syntax of mathematical theory, mathematical language. Um, and my, my book elaborated that idea and those will try to. But then I had the following thought, it proved quite fruitful in the end, namely, what if one said the same thing about sentences and truth? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the root conception of the truth of a sentence is a projection from its acceptability. Okay, and that, that of course, is exactly the deflationist idea about yeah. truth. So truth, in a sense, is thin. Uh, when you endorse a statement, you'll endorse it as having some virtue or other, as it being fully justified, known, um, a likely conjecture, whatever. But the form of the endorsement just describes the truth predicate to it. Okay, so you have a kind of thin overall endorsement property, truth. Yeah. And that was the root idea. When I started thinking about that and realized it wouldn't do, as I thought, for the reason of the argument that I gave in the first chapter of the book. But I developed these ideas, most of them, in Princeton in my seminars. And then they sort of sat idle for um, a number of years until I, again, was fortunate to get a fellowship at Oxford, a visiting fellowship at Magdalen. And they said, you know you have to give some lectures when you're here. <laughs> So I thought, oh God. <laughs> um, but yes, I do have this material, so I lecture on that. And the experience of lecturing in Oxford, giving this material then, really was what finally shaped the, the form the book eventually took. So that, that was the... Yeah. In fact, at the end of some chapter, there is also some of the discussion that you had. Yes, that's the right, yes. That's, and Tim, Tim Williamson asked questions, which are listed there. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I remember him sitting in the front um, with this sort of look of, you know, What's going on here? <laughs> what on earth is this stuff? <laughs> it was a good occasion. It was nice. Uh, and what, what do you think is the best achievement of the, the project? Of the I, th I think probably the seminar we've just had. I don't, I'd, <laughs> philosophical achievement. I, I, I think if people found it interesting, and they clearly have, um, and have written good stuff about it, um, that's an achievement. Mm -hmm. I mean, Achievement of any philosophy is it's not just, uh, I, I, look, what do philosophers do philosophy for? It's, it's not to arrive at the truth, because if you're any good at the subject, and you get into the issues properly, you'll realize that every philosophical view is contestable. Yeah. Okay. There's no such thing as proving a philosophical thesis in the way that you can in mathematics, for example. Right. So the target has to be different. It has to be to discuss issues in a way that displays how complex they are, what the questions are, that should arise, um, and what the options are, yeah. you know, different ways of approaching them, and to try to do that well. So if the book has an achievement, then it's in, in that kind of dimension. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one, of, one of the things that has been discussed quite widely uh, recently um, that comes uh, from this book is the idea that we may have a plurality of uh, truth uh, concepts or truth properties. Um, and so the, the kind of model, uh, pluralistic model that you have uh, suggested in the book is now used also to explore other sorts of areas in philosophy like um, pluralism about being or pluralism about logic. So, and that, that seems to be a quite fruitful tool. So do you think it's... Uh, I, do th I do think that's interesting, yeah. I, th I'm, I haven't applied it in all the areas where I think that um, it might, might be illuminating to do that. Mm -hmm. but. Originally, it's a reaction against the traditional conception of philosophical analysis, 
so round about the turn of the 19th, 20th century, mm -hmm. philosophers are thinking what analysis does is to penetrate down and tell you what something really is. Okay. Um, we have this kind of superficial grasp of justice, truth, beauty, whatever, goodness. And now the philosopher will s somehow, not never made entirely clear how, how this is supposed mm -hmm. to happen, but the philosopher will somehow penetrate the essence of these ideas and tell you what they really consist in. And I thought, well, yeah, penetrate, essence. Um, this all sounds theoretically very loaded and perhaps right. unbelievable. Um, but what the philosopher can do is remind us of the way we think about it concepts of that kind, things that we accept as generally true, even if you have controversial views about what is just or what is true. Um, they're controversial because we agree about you know, some framework stuff. But those are things I call platitudes in truth and objectivity. Mm -hmm. So you can give a little theory of those and then ask yourself the question, well, what kind of property um, would display, would, would satisfy, or let's say model, those platitudes? And perhaps there are several answers. Okay. Um, so I was thinking of, of an analysis in philosophy, not, not as uncovering real meanings, because the real meanings are actually quite superficial, okay. but rather what conditions or properties would exemplify those meanings and be of interest to us, things we'd value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, and that, that then is the germ of the pluralist idea, because you can then have the thought that, well, maybe several different properties will satisfy the platitudes in the case mm -hmm. of truth in different areas, and maybe their value is different too in those different areas, the way we, why we value them, why we aim at the truth. The answer to that will not be systematic either. So that was the root idea, and it is applicable elsewhere. Um, Patrick, in our sessions, has cited the case of knowledge. I think it, um, I haven't done the work, but I, I would like someone to do a project like that on knowledge. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And this was also <coughs> a way to uh, reconceptualize the debate on, on realism and anti-realism, which, I mean, plays a very important role, I mean, that with respect to this very traditional question that every philosophy <laughs> student addresses, in truth as ob objectivity, there is a, an idea of trying to, to, to at least have Indeed. a better idea of the, what is the debate. Indeed, but in, in a way, th um, th that way of putting the question centralizes it. You know, I, I, I'm going to reconfigure the debates about mm -hmm. realism, but that's not the order of gestation. Mm -hmm. The order of gestation is, look, um, we have a concept of truth, um, Let's just not worry about its applicability across the board. Anything that you know, has an indicative surface is truth apt. Okay. Having got to that point, let's ask what would be the property that is of value to us in this area or that area or that area, which models that concept in various ways. And then the thought occurs. Okay, may, maybe by making distinctions among the important property, okay, we can get a grip on what's at stake in realist views of truth or anti-realist views of truth and so on. So that's actually quite far down the tracks. The application, although, although in the book it's presented as upfront, you know, it's what it's all about. The thought that maybe we can get a grip on those, those metaphysical issues um, is quite late in the sequence. So I, I would like to return to uh, your time in Oxford because I, I, I would like to ask you, I mean, given that Oxford is known as one of the sort of most impressive uh, places for uh, like doing philosophy, uh, among other things, of course, um, so I'm, I'm curious about your experience there in Oxford as a student and, and then as a fellow. So, um, uh, yeah. So at first I'm just finishing my Cambridge PhD mm -hmm. and working with Dummett. Um, and I, I think his model uh, was hugely influential for me. I mean, he's very impressive physically um, <laughs> and personally. You know, coming out with these paragraph form sentences, perfectly formed, perfectly thought through right. in his lectures, you know, it's just dazzling. Uh, daunting in a way. But also, I, I, I think I'd learned in Cambridge from my tutor, Casimir Louis, as an undergrad, how to think about certain questions, which you don't know when you start philosophy. You know, what's it to think about this kind of question in an effective way? But I didn't know what to think about. I hadn't, you know, I hadn't really learned a subject matter that I thought I could, I could think usefully about. Dummett taught me that. Um, I thought this, this idea that mathematics resonates with things that are external and objective, on the other hand, is simply a artifact of the human mind. That's a very interesting distinction. But how do you think about it? Mm -hmm. you know, how, how do I make that distinction discussable right. and get in a position where you might say, well, this is the better view rather than that? Yeah. Okay. And he, he really gave me um, an initial insight into that, which was to tie it down to content and truth conditions. Um, so 
Although I think, I, I, I don't think he would approve of this book. I mean, he was kind when I gave the lectures and said, yeah. I think that's the best you've done, thing you've done. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, I don't think he would like the term intervention of text because it rejects his idea, right. the master idea about realism. Um, but I, I think the general sort of approach is very Dometian. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, okay. it's, it's work that couldn't have happened but for Dummett. Okay. And then after in, in your... I was very confident at this stage. You asked me about my experience. I, yeah. I had no doubt I could do this. You know, um, quite, quite irrational, unjustified confidence. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wonder whether I should get a job. Uh, there were various fellowships at the colleges, teaching fellowships, which came up, which I thought I had applied for in big capacity. But then I learned that All Souls College mm -hmm. had these initial early career seven-year research fellowships. I got asked. <laughs> that, that's the thing to get. Right. So to get it, you had to go and have tea with Warden Sparrow, who was the head of the college. And you know, he'd look you over and say, yes, I want to encourage you to apply. Um, but he didn't say that. What he said was, I'm looking at your CV, and, and you don't appear to be eligible um, because you don't have an Oxford degree. That's true. Um, so I thought, well, I, nothing deterred. I told you I was confident. Nothing deterred. I set about getting an Oxford degree, which was the BPhil, which is normally a, a two-year course. But the statutes provide for the possibility of getting it in one year. So I put everything off for a year, sat the BPhil, got it, and then went back to All Souls and reapplied. And <laughs> was awarded with a fellowship. <laughs> That's good. And that was fantastic. I mean, it's, it's such an opportunity. You, got, you, know, you were encouraged to give classes, but they were research classes, not undergraduate teaching. So I gave a seminar on each term, and that was hugely instructive. But also I could work on whatever I wanted. There were no constraints, hence the attempt at Hegel. Yeah, I had yeah. time for that. Um, I even thought seven years I could get a medical degree in that time, maybe be an analyst or something. You know, that seemed quite attractive at that stage of my life. Uh, but eventually I wrote a book on Wittgenstein. Um, and it went down quite well. I got a chair on the basis of that at St. Andrews at quite a young age. And the rest you know. That's what yeah. You could so yeah, about St. Andrews, I think there's a, there's a very important chapter of your life. Absolutely, uh, and yes. uh, so there you establish uh, the Archaea Research Center which, I mean, has been really amazing, one, one of the best research centers in the world. Again, it was a matter of luck. I mean, I, I didn't have a clear concept of what a research center might be, yeah. how it might work in philosophy. But I, I did have the notion that one and the same environment could both provide um, scope for collaboration among senior philosophers, um, but also a training environment. You involve PhD students and postdocs from the start in the project, and they collaborate as equals, yeah. come right through. And that was the idea. It was just so successful. Um, and we may just have been lucky in having very good students coming in. But the fact is that, that the RK students did amazingly well in a very difficult climate. They all got jobs. They've all published. They've all done good work since. Uh, so there's something in that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it didn't last because I made bad mistakes. Um, it was. Time came, we got an initial tranche of seven years' money from the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And coming to the end of that, the council said, for a very small, limited number of centers of this kind, we will give a second term of seven more years. Um, the bar is very high. And I set about devising research projects for the second term uh, on relativism, on basic knowledge, and various other things. Um, we had a good academic application. And I think we were in the shout of getting it. Um, but then there was a logistical point that was made. Look, you know, um, you are no longer a young man. Um, what happens if you pop off? We we'll give you the money, and then you disappear. And then what? You need to appoint um, leaders who can step into the breach in those circumstances. So I persuaded the university to give us two new professorial appointments. That itself was extraordinary at that time. Um, because already you know, things were financially difficult. New, new chairs from scratch were almost unheard of. Yeah. Um, so we got them. And I have to say, I, maybe I shouldn't say this on camera. I don't know. <laughs> but as it turned out, in my judgment, I made two very bad appointments. 
which were inconsistent with the ethos of the center and the way it worked. Um, because what was needed was people to step into this role of leading research, but at the same time leading research of equals and suggesting directions and receiving directions sympathetically and you know, generally fomenting the collaboration that we had that was so successful. And the people we appointed were not interested in doing that. So we came into collision. Um, it was clear something had to give. The university didn't understand the nature of the collision. Uh, somehow or other, they got the impression that Crispin is sitting on these new initiatives that these new young appointments are making. You know. um, I've forgotten what the term is they use for that. You know. mm. What you get is that we're an old fart. You know. yeah, right, right. Yeah, but anyway, that, that, that was the thought that prevailed. I hope it's not true, but that, that prevailed. So I felt I had an opportunity but to resign. Um, but I wasn't prepared to let, let the operation go. So we started again in Aberdeen, who were very keen to receive us at that point. And Filippo was one of the first <laughs> students in that, in that environment. Okay. That too has turned out pretty successful. Right. <laughs> yes. I, I want to say something about <coughs> this uh, part of your life. I mean, I was in Arche during uh, the good years, and mm. uh, these, I mean, seminars were tough. But I learned something which I think is very important. I try to also to communicate to the students here the idea that philosophy it's not an individual enterprise. Mm. It's it's like in the sciences actually, even if in a different way collaboration and working in groups, in a research group, in a community, it's really central. Because Absolute, in absolutely Italy, right. Yeah, in yeah. Italy, there is somehow this romantic ideal of the individual philosopher. The solitary thinker, isolated. that's right. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the idea in the UK, too, at that time. Um, and that is the respect in which I think RK was path-breaking. Because for reasons, as you say, not the same as those in science, which is, you know, I guess the scientific thought is, if we collaborate, we have a better chance of arriving at good theory. Um, but the motive for collaboration in philosophy is, look, we all have an interest in these issues, and we think about them and discuss them better when we help each other. Right. Yeah. Help each other to see what's a good argument, help each other to see they're thinking about the thing in a bad way, learn from other people. Okay. Suddenly, the quality of, of the discussion and this is shown in the publication that it generates, it just rises exponentially. Yeah. Yeah. It's communication. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I think the proof is in the pudding, and this basic idea of philosophical research has generalized across Europe. You know, um, the idea of collaborative research projects is, is firmly entrenched now with the ERC, right. for example. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I like to think we kind of pioneered it. <laughs> Nowadays, to a philosophy student starting, you know, like uh, his studies, our studies uh, as a PhD or even as early career student, uh, what are the topics that you think are interesting? Do you have any idea? What would you say to someone who decides to start studying philosophy in 2020. Well, firstly, as I said to you before, don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it expecting to make a career out of it. Because the sad truth is, is that there are any number of really excellent students, okay, who in the present climate cannot get a job. There's no realistic prospect of it. So don't, don't be beset with the idea, this is my career choice. Um, you have, you have to maintain versatility. You, if you're going to do philosophy, do it for the interest of what you want to do and keep your options open. Yeah. Maybe get some collateral to create you of some kind, okay, that you give you an exit strategy. But also, I'm, I'm aware the subject is changing for reasons I don't fully understand. I mean, I, I think of myself as a fairly traditional philosopher. I um, was a hard core of classic metaphysical and epistemological questions which still engage me. But even at NYU, um, where the graduate students are, by and large, successful in finding jobs. You know, it's, it's a very prestigious university. The things they're doing strike me as small, mm -hmm. in general. You know, they're, they're focusing on minutiae, where they can get a publication, a competent publication, out quickly. And there isn't the same, the same emphasis on issues that are you know, more general and more difficult, yeah. impossibly difficult. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, the, the economic climate is, is affecting what people are doing. 
uh, I guess, regrettable. Um, I may be quite wrong. It may be that in 25, 30 years, you look back and say, well, actually, those changes are very good. People are thinking about new problems in interesting ways, and the work is very good. It may turn out like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, I don't feel confident in that at the moment. Yeah, there is one way of reading sort of um, the current situation, a sort of Kuhnian way, as, uh, as sort of a standard science. So uh, a mm -hmm. lot of philosophy now uh, might be taught as standard, uh, uh, standardized yes. science, and they, with a, a lot of uh, sort of emphasis on uh, publishing results in order to get a job or in order mm -hmm. to improve your uh, CV in that respect. And, uh, so one, one might ask whether so there's going to be any uh, sort of revolutionary ideas uh, anytime soon, or if you think there, there might be sort of certain topics that might lead to a sort of breakthrough. I don't know. Um, I don't have enough distance from the directions that you know, are being followed. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot of papers that I go to. Um, I don't understand the title. Mm -hmm. in advance. What's this going to be about? Don't know. Well, I go along anyway. <laughs> um, and then it turns out the speaker is preoccupied with certain questions, and my reaction will be, well, yeah, I guess you could think about those questions. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's only exceptionally that, that someone's saying something really interesting about the alleged free will problem, or about vagueness, or about traditional skeptical paradoxes in epistemology or about the nature of mathematical truth, or the a priori, or necessity, all these things that I've, I've fussed about in my career. Um, so, you know, the, there's a kind of effort of giving attention to this, and maybe I get something out of it, and sometimes you do. You know, here's a question I haven't thought about, it's interesting. But usually there's a sense of, you know, one's going through the motions a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's just a reflection of the subject changing, I guess. No. Do you think that something good uh, came out from this workshop? I, I hope so. Um, one of the good things that might have come out, which we can't tell yet, is to infuse some of the students you know, who are joining in. Mm -hmm. um, if they get ideas for their PhDs, or you know, if you just pass the PhD, um, that's great. Um, I, 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 mean, I did have this fantasy in the last session that the whole thing was fake, okay, and I was just being conned into thinking people were interested in my work. I didn't really have a fantasy, but I, I played with it. Right. Um, but I'm you know, pretty certain that wasn't the case. You know, I, I, one good thing that came out is you know, it's, it's nice when people find your ideas worth talking about and interesting. I mean, that's, what better reward could you get for you know, writing philosophy than that? Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, this was an example where I, I, I felt pretty vividly that was the case. So yes, for me personally, it's huge. Um, there are lots of good points made about things I do think about, but something I hadn't thought about at all, and which now strikes me as very interesting, um, is an issue that Matty Eklund brought up. Um, he raised the question whether or not, suppose we go along with the idea that you know, truth is, loosely speaking, different things in different areas. Okay. What determines what kind of truth is appropriate to which area? Is that just purely a function of the subject matter? So this is mathematics, or this is physics, or this is ethics. Does that settle that question? Or is it a question that's simply not settled, except sociologically? We, we just opt for a certain conception, okay, without any reason. Or is there some other kind of settlement? Perhaps, uh, I, I was suggesting myself earlier, the, the value we place on correct opinion in the area in question determines the kind of truth we want to find there. Um, I've never thought that, uh, about that before. I think it's an excellent question. And I think it is of direct relevance to all the fuss about post-truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, we, we think in areas where people play post-truth that no, no, truth here has to be conceived as something robust and evidentially properly conditioned. You're not just free to think what you like about these things. Um, as a sense of real danger in the opposing point of view, if it is a point of view, I'm not just cynical, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I, I, I think I'd like to know that there is a pure philosophical answer to that question. I don't know if there is. Um, and I would like those who think differently, postmodernists or whatever, post-truth people, to confront that answer you know, and see what they're made of. Yeah. So yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs>